והיה עקב תשמעו את המשפטים האלה. And will be that when you listen to these laws, you shmar them and see them with them, and you will do them and perform them. Veshamar Adonai Elech Alechad the Brit and the Chesed Shabbat Levotecha and Hashem will safeguard the Brit and the Chesed, the covenant and the kindness that He promised your forefathers. And by Hevcha Uvarecha, and He will love you and bless you Virbecha, and He will make you multiply Uvarech Pri Betecha Ufri Admatecha Derecha Vdoshcha Vitzarecha. שגר על אפיך והשטרות שונאיך על אדמה של בעל עבדיך תדעך and Hashem will bless you, will multiply you He'll bless the fruit of your womb, your grain, your wine, your fields everything Hashem will give you blessing ברוך תהיה מכל העמים You will be blessed from all the nations לא יהיה בך עקר ועקרה ובמתיך Nobody from you, not a man, not a woman, not even your animals will be barren They could all have children וסיר אדוני ממך כל חולי and Hashem will remove from you all sickness וכל מדווי מצרים הרעים אשר ידעת לא ישימם בך ונתנם בכל שונאיך אל השם will not give you any of the illnesses of מצרים maybe if you want to move down one more then you can sit here they will uh... thank you just to kill the door this is Spanish this is Spanish, this is different all the sicknesses השם put in מצרים he will not put on you We'll put them on your enemies. And you will devour all the people that Hashem will deliver before you. Don't have any compassion on them. Don't worship their idols. They'll just be a trap for you. How are we going to conquer all these nations? You'll be afraid. Hashem says, don't be afraid. Remember what Hashem did before. The first sentence of this parasha is the one that interests me the most today. V'haya ekev tishmo. This will be the reward when you listen to these mitzvot. Oh, like the book of the What? It's kind of like the parasha of the book of the Torah. Yes, it's very, it's very good. It's very similar to the parasha of the book of the Torah. It's your parasha, no? Yeah. Ekev. No, no, no. Oh, because he's repeating basically. Ekev Gosh. means once you will. Ekev, like you. after you listen, this is the reward that you'll receive. That's the word very good. That's what word Ekev means. Art scrolls English is out of order because they're, they're trying to make an English sentence. So what's written in the end, they're putting in the beginning of the sentence. Okay. Says Rashi. Well, she writes in, underneath where it says you'd bet. If you want to see in English, you look at the bottom right, it says midrashically, the word ekev. Look all the way down the commentary. I see Vaya ekev tishmoon. Ima mitzvot akalot shadam. Dash bikvav tishmoon. He's saying, what does it mean, ekev? The word ekev, the midrash says, means something. Ekev means a heel. Yaakov. If the mitzvot then most people step on them. Meaning, most people think they're not so important. If you listen to those mitzvot, this will happen to you. <coughs> so the Midrash says, why does it, this, this is very similar to Bechukotai. What's special here than different than Bechukotai? Speaking of Bechukotai Terechu, now if you go my way or not. Here, it seems like Kedosh Bechuk is referring to the things that other people don't take so seriously. Other mitzvot that other people don't take so seriously. It's interesting because when you use it in Hebrew, Ekev usually refers to something that already happened. Was. The Haya, when it will be Ekev, when it happens. It's a contradictory tenses. The Haya is the future. Like a, like a prof- Ekev prophecy. is the past. Really? Yeah. It's two words that directly contradict each other. That's a good point. You'll notice Rashi mm-hmm. brings his source in parentheses, Tanchuma, Aleph. Rashi says it to Midrash Tanchuma, to Parashat Ekev, for the first part of Parashat Ekev. Let me read you from the Midrash, I printed it out here. The Midrash says, Okay. Blessed is the name of Hashem who gave a Torah to the Jewish people. I'm reading now from a Midrash. Sheesh bat taryag mitzvot. It has 613 mitzvot. Vyesh behen kalot vachamurot. And it has inside of the Torah light mitzvot and heavy mitzvot. When I'm using light and heavy, I mean like serious and less serious. Those that people take seriously. Because we're saying if you follow the mitzvot that other people step on, 
Now we want to say, what are those mitzvot that other people step on? מפני שיש בהן מצוות קלות שאין בני אדם משגיחים בהן, אלה שמשליכים אותן תחת יפיהן, כלומר שהן קלות. Because there are some mitzvot that people think they're not so important and they step on them, they trample on them. לפיכך היה דוד מתערם מיום הדין. דוד המלך was very afraid of the day of judgment. ואומר, he would say, ריבונו של עולם, master of the universe. איני מתערם אל המצוות החמורות שבתורה. I'm not afraid of the, of the serious מצוות of the Torah, the heavy ones, the strict ones. Why? שהן חמורות, that's strict. I mean, I'm not, person's gonna break Shabbat. There are things that people are very careful about. ממה אני מתאר? What am I afraid of? מן המצוות הקלות. I'm afraid of the מצוות that people don't regard. שמה עברתי על אחת מהן, אם עשיתי, אם לא עשיתי, מפני שהייתה קרה. I'm afraid that maybe I didn't keep those, and that's why David Amalek says in Tehillim, למה יירא בימי רעב עונה? עקבי יסובני. Why am I afraid of the day of wrong? עקבי, my heels, he's worried about his heels, he's worried about the mitzvot that he tramples on. There are a bunch of other Midrashim that say something very similar. Ekev. Let me tell you, the Psikta Zutrata, Midrash Lechach Tov. Midrash says, Dabar Acher, what does it mean? Vaya Ekev Tishmaun, Ubi Ekev Tishmaun, Dikduke HaMitzvot. They're the details of the Mitzvot. The particulars. A lot of people will keep Shabbat. A lot of people will eat Kashem. The question is, what about the details? Do they know the details? They observe of these details. They care about these details. It's a very similar teaching to Diktu Kei Mitzvot, the Ekev Tishmo. This is a teaching we have in Parki Avot. The second chapter of Parki Avot, in the first Mishnah, so Rabbi Omer, Rabbi says, Ezuhi derech yishara shiavor lo hada. What is the proper path that a person should go on? Who is Rabbi? Rabbi Danasi, the author of the Mishnah. Kol shi tiferet lo seam, vetiferet lo min hada. <coughs> I didn't come to focus on this part. I mean, anything that gives glory to he who does it. Be careful about the light mitzvot, like you are about the heavy mitzvot. Because you don't know what the reward of every mitzvah is. You think you know this mitzvah, this mitzvah you know what a kush who thinks is important. Sometimes what we think is, you know, a person goes on a lahavdir make a thousand different choices. You go on a job interview and they ask questions. You think this is a really important question. You ask right data. They have specific questions. They're trying to hear something out of you. And what you think is an important question was really just misleading. They're asking you a different question on top of that question that you didn't think was so important. That's exactly where they got you. <laughs> Very good. There are a lot of places where you see that you don't always know what is so important or what's not so important. You think. You have an assumption. But sometimes the assumption is incorrect. Wow, you know, we once had a situation. Kohen didn't go up to the Dukhan in time for Brikat Kohen. There's a certain place in which you have to go up, or else the Chamin say you don't go up. This person didn't go up, and then they went up. So they wanted to take them down. And his Kohen was, what do you mean, me be a man of Kohen anymore? Argument. And here it was very silly. You see, this idea Chamin say not to go up. There's a pasuk that they learn this out from, but it's a remez. It's, it's like a light illusion that once a kohen misses the chance, he shouldn't go up. But if he goes up, you have to pull him down. No, in fact, pulling a kohen down, this mitzvah, you make a blessing to Hashem, Kedushan, Tovet Zivanu. That's an actual mitzvah. But a person doesn't know the origins of something, so they confuse one thing is more important than the other thing, and they lost. They lost. In Hebrew, say Yatzas Chavon Behefsedot. You, you threw the baby out with the bathwater. You lost the main thing. I mean, you got into something, but you lost the main thing. In Halakha, we have the same thing. People don't always know how to weigh things. And they don't know how to decide between Halakha. And because of that, they make a lot of mistakes. Here, Ilkei really isn't focusing as Halakha. It's not a book of Halakha. 
It's trying to tell you something more. That even if you weigh mitzvot, you think this one's biblical, this one's rabbinic, this one is uh, mitzvah this is mitzvah lotase, all kinds of things. Don't be so sure that you know how important one mitzvah is over another mitzvah. And then this is really interesting. לבי מחשב הפסד מצווה כנגד שכרה, ושכר עבירה כנגד הפסדה. Start making calculations. What will happen if I miss this מצווה? What happens if I do that עבירה? What are the consequences of those actions? And then you can make calculations based off of them. I don't want to deal with the second part because it complicates my conversation. But the first part here, be careful with a small מצווה like you are about a big מצווה. Let's ask an obvious question. You have two מצוות that contradict each other. Which one do you follow? You can you have one chance to do a mitzvah, and there's two mitzvot that are available. One is a serious mitzvah, one is not such a serious mitzvah. Which one do you do? Depend what mitzvah is. One is serious, and one is not so serious. Well, can one be done no, later? I mean, it's one like time bound. Yeah. But normally you would do. Good. Let's give an example where it's not. Uh, there, there's no chance to do it later. The one that applies that. Like Shabbat and. Or, or person that you have to take to the hospital. Okay, so saving a life versus keeping Shabbat. But you need to so save example. somebody's life. You make another. Yeah, but what's more important, Shabbat or saving a life? Saving a life. Saving a life. But what did Chachamim just tell me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you should break Shabbat in order to save a life. But I want to be careful. I want to be careful about the small mitzvah also. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to save a life. What is it? It says be careful with the small mitzvah like you are with the big mitzvah. So I'm going to be the one. You want to break Shabbat, you break Shabbat. I'm the one. Who, I want to be careful with a smaller mitzvah like a big mitzvah. I know it sounds horrific. It's a very drastic example. By the way, why does Shabbat pull up for saving a person's life? They can do more mitzvah. A rabbi say, desecrate one Shabbat for him now, so in the future he'll keep any more Shabbat. This has many theological ramifications about saving people's lives that are, Shabbat is not relevant to them. And I'm not, God forbid, suggesting that as a halakha. I'm suggesting it's a thought. It's a thought. The logic is not that life is more important than Shabbat, necessarily, as much as it's a long term versus a short term. In the short term, violate Shabbat, because in the long term, this person will keep any more Shabbatot. But let's pretend. We're going to use this example as a heavy. These are both pretty heavy things. So Shabbat and saving a life. Yeah. Um, but if a person focuses on the, the small thing, because that's what it says in the Mishnah. So already there were Chachamim that dealt with this. The Baal Benel says, I'm reading to, I don't have a Baal Benel in front of me now. I'm reading to read the Tosfot Yom Tov. He says, What does it mean be careful about a mitzvah, a light mitzvah, like a heavy mitzvah? In terms of being careful. But not in terms of anything else. What does that mean? Let me read to you. L'inyan zirut, liyot zariz u mahir bu mitzvah kala, kamo shu zariz u mahir bu mitzvah chamua. You should be uh, with alacrity, you should do very fast, you should be very particular to do a small mitzvah like you are a big mitzvah. And he's not coming to tell you that when two mitzvot come to your hands, one is light and one is heavy. He says, that, You don't have an opportunity, like Baruch said, you can't do it later, so you have to choose now what you want to do. He's not coming to teach you, so do the light one and not the heavy one. She'en ha-sechel sovlo. Your logic cannot agree to such a thing. Ela le'inyan zirut bilvad humer. Rather, it's only coming to tell you about being careful. V'kol achad v'chad b'shata, v'chach k'yoshu rabbeinu yitzchak abar menen v'dechayim. Meaning, if I have to choose between a heavy mitzvah and a light mitzvah, I choose the heavy mitzvah. But when it comes to being careful, don't say, I keep all the heavy mitzvot, who cares about the small ones? Rather, no, I have to keep all the mitzvot. <coughs> How much do I have to keep the small mitzvot? Just like I keep the big ones. But if I have to actually choose between a big one and a small one, a heavy one and a light one, what do I choose? The heavy one. And we do this all the time in Hanukkah. And Hanukkah will say, it's better if you do this than to do that. It will be better that you didn't do it anyways. But there's an ideal here of being zahir, to be careful. And there's once you're really not following an ideal, in that situation, you have to choose one over the other. This teaching is not coming to contradict halachot. It's not coming to keep a rabbinic mitzvah over a biblical. No. In a case where you could do both, do both. And in a case where you have to choose one, choose the more important one. But if you don't have to choose, don't choose. Don't neglect certain mitzvot because you think they're not so important. I think now, we really have to start thinking 
what are examples of heavy mitzvot and light mitzvot? I, we hear this a lot, and this is really the focus of my shield tonight. And you know, don't, don't focus on the small stuff and the big stuff. What are you talking about? What is the practical case of this? Rabbi Yosef Masas, when he taught this in his book, Nachalat Avot, he spends a lot of effort on breaking down different categories of mitzvot, and I want to share with you some of those things. This is the first way to understand this Mishnah. What is a light mitzvah? What is a heavy mitzvah? Yesh mitzvah shikana be'asiyata, yesh mitzvah shikhamua be'asiyata. There are some mitzvot, mitzvot which are more difficult to do than others. Meaning it's not what's more important, per se, as in what is more difficult to accomplish. For example, kana be'asiyata, what's an easy mitzvah to accomplish? Tukia shofa, blowing the shofa. Why is blowing the shofa so easy? Does everyone here know how to blow a shofar? Mm. So why is it such an easy mitzvah? You just do it once in a while? That would be a different category. It's what you do sometimes, but it's what you do all the time. You just do it, you know, it's a fair... You do it Say better than that. Who here blows... Which of you blow a shofar and wash around here? You don't. Why? Do you have to blow the shofar? No. No, you can no, just you listen to, to it. Listen to it. Is there anything easier than just sitting there listening to something? So that's an easy mitzvah. You think it's a hard mitzvah, but really that's an easy mitzvah. And because it's so easy, you might come to say, yeah, it's not a big deal. I don't even have to do it. I just have to listen to someone else doing it. V'chem nitilat lulav, send it with a lulav. V'chem mitzvah shechita, the mitzvah of slaughtering an animal. You slaughter your own animals? No, you just have to make sure you buy an animal that was slaughtered by somebody else. You don't have to buy the animal and clean the animal and slaughter the animal and, and, and take out all the blood. You don't do any of that. I mean, if you were to tell me you're the shochet, maybe that's a hard mitzvah. But you're just a kosher consumer, it's not so hard for you to buy kosher meat. So that's an easy mitzvah. What about the poor people? Mitzvah kisui hadam. There's a mitzvah of covering the blood. When you slaughter an animal to cover the blood, what do you have to do? Take a shovel, cover the blood. That's what you have to do. You cover it. It's not a big mitzvah. It's a very big mitzvah. It's a, it's a commandment. It's okay. Adam wa anaf. We say that blood is the soul. It's respect to the animal's blood that we do. Mitzvat mipnei sevat akum v'hadarta pnei zaken. Standing up for an elderly person or for a righteous person. It's so hard for you when an old person comes to the room to stand up for them? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe because you're too old, it's too hard to stand up? What is old in Halakha you have to stand up for? Okay. There's a makhluk in between the makubalim and the puskim. Some say 60, some say 70. No one should be offended. But if someone comes near you, that's 60 or 70, you have to stand up. Halakha from the Torah. It's a biblical command. Achilat matzah. Eating matzah. Achilat maror. Eating maror. Many more things. Did you know these last two? Because you live in a different Judaism, you don't know how... What's how hard to eat an olive size of a cracker? But because today they tell you that an olive size of a cracker is the size of the whole matzah, and you have to eat it within two minutes, and you have to... Now it became very hard to eat matzah. One matzah used to be lettuce. And you have to eat a kezayit, an olive size of lettuce. How many of you have lettuce in your salad? Oh, yeah. How hard is it for you to have one bite of Roman lettuce? But once they turn marog into horseradish, how hard is it for you to have an olive size of spoonful really of horseradish? Mm. It's a different story. It's not even talking about, uh, not even 40 years. And we said Masas is telling you something that was so easy 40 years ago, today is really so difficult. So we can't even relate so much to this. They didn't show on that shmore matzah that was made 12, 8 months ago. At least it didn't get any more stale than it was 8 months ago. <laughs> What's a hard mitzvah to do? Mitzvah ta'anit. Fasting. Fasting is a hard mitzvah. You want to keep away? Do you have to stop the day before? Mitzvah sukkah. To build a sukkah. It's not hard to build a sukkah. Yeah, today in Zafir, they need pop-up sukkahs. So see, something's changed. You notice they, the, the way they do them. But living inside of the sukkah, sleeping in the sukkah, eating in the sukkah, being out of your comfort zone. Mitzvah kibud avayim. Notice it's very easy to stand up for an old person. It's much more difficult to respect your parents. Let's be honest. It's a very difficult mitzvah. I don't know anyone who could say, 
I got that mitzvah down pat. I'm good. It's a very difficult mitzvah to keep. It's not part of being a parent is to try to make that mitzvah easier. To know that it's hard. And to try to do what you can to make that relationship easier. Because you're not getting an avera from being disrespected, but you're causing a child to, to get an avera when they disrespect you. It's one of the Ten Commandments. It doesn't mean to give up on any dignity you have, but it means to help, to realize it's a natural human thing to struggle with this, and not that that should be your whole point of contention in life. Shmirat Shabbat, Yom Tov, all these mitzvot are very long, they're very hard. There's a second way to understand this. Says Rabbi Yosef Masas, it could be different. Yes, kala b'hotza and chamura b'hotza. Some mitzvot are more expensive. Some mitzvot are less expensive. For example, uh, what's an inexpensive mitzvah? It's amazing because some of these things for us are a whole different world. I'm not telling the putting on the right shoe first. <laughs> oh, that's not that doesn't cost money even. <laughs> Buying a mezuzah. How much is mezuzah? Forty bucks, fifty bucks. Talit. Have a nice talit. What is a nice talit? A little over a hundred dollars. Yeah. But a nice one. And I don't why do you wear the plastic one in the defense? A nice one. 120. 120. Okay. <laughs> and how often do you buy a talit? How often do you buy a mitzvah? Meaning, maybe mitzvah is expensive now, but you get a mitzvah for it every single second it's on your door. So if you do the math of how long you're going to have this mitzvah, Versus how much you paid for it, it's not a normal. Your Shabbat candle lasts you as long as they stay lit. That's how long the mitzvah. Your mitzvah, as long as it doesn't go bad, it's sitting on your door. It's a mitzvah from the Torah, and every extra one you have. Tell it. You buy tell it once every few years. You don't have to buy it every day. You wear it every day, and every minute that you wear it is a mitzvah. What else? Shofar, tefillin, megillah. Hanukkah candles, Shabbat candles, so the mehem muatim, which the meshbem are beshanim, vyesh hu vizawa chalam. You use it for many years. It's not so expensive. It's feeling are expensive, that's the truth. But feeling is the kind of thing you use your whole life. So if you know, you bought a very expensive pair of feeling. $2,500 feeling. That's a crazy bill. You got $2,500. And then you wear your feeling for 25 years. You paid $100 a year for feeling. That's not even like 30 cents a day. It's not a joke for one of the most important biblical mitzvot. So whereas you might think tefillin is an expensive mitzvah, it's really not. It's expensive up front. But the, what you get out of it the rest of your life is uh, unbelievable. What's more difficult? Pesach. Yamim tovim. Holidays, Pesach. Imagine how much money you spend cooking for the holidays. Think about it. Buying new clothes for the holidays. If you're traveling somewhere, you're having people travel to you. Buying, this your, wife a buying your wife a gift for that jewelry <laughs> for the holidays. <laughs> your wife buying you a gift for the holidays. <laughs> Just reminded you. Think about it. It's eight days of, they say the miracle of Hanukkah is that your salary of 30 days lasts you not even six. That's the miracle of Hanukkah. This is a, it's, very, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. And when does it happen? Every year. All the three times a year, five times a year. <laughs> Every single every week you should have Shabbat. People make a big deal how expensive their Thanksgiving dinner is. One stupid turkey and some rice with canned cranberry sauce on it. Your Shabbat every week is more expensive than Thanksgiving. And if it's not more expensive than Thanksgiving, then at least your four Shabbat total month are more expensive than Thanksgiving. And you do that every single week. And then he adds again, Umagam kibud horim. I have to quit respecting your parents in this category too. It's a very expensive mitzvah. Why is it expensive, kibud horim? There are a lot of calculations you make, thank you. A lot of calculations you make in life that have to do with parents, respecting parents, if it's flying to visit parents. Both my grandparents lived in Israel, both sets. And sure, my parents made a choice to come live here. The part of their choice of at least the minimum of trying to respect them by going to spend summers with them or piss up with them, and it's five kids and two adults, and it's flying back and forth, it's renting a car, all of that that you do, and then you could say it's needless, you could have lived next door. So there's another price you would pay for living next door near your parents. And you know how much money that is? Tens of thousands of dollars. If you make a choice to do kibbutz Aven with, your parents need something, you buy them something, they want something. That... In our generation, we're a little bit different. It used to be parents get old and they move in with you. You don't pay the senior home 
money and yeah, we'll visit you on Thanksgiving. Your parents become your problem. So for their whole life, they're trying to take care of you. Now things turn and certain jobs to take care of that. And a lot of people are very uncomfortable with that. There's a saying, a street saying, that it takes one parent can raise ten children, but ten children can't raise one parent. And that's right. Because even if financially they could do it, to give the proper dignity and the respect and the care and the... It's very difficult for kids to... There's daughters-in-law that are involved, sons-in-law that are involved. And you have a life, you have a job, you have a... So you can, you know, mom, come, live with us, I'll give you a little room, put a TV in. She sits there all day alone. Now you're doing a mitzvah more than you could if she was living in a homeless shelter somewhere. But what is what kind of a mitzvah is that? I have a bird, a pet bird. They say if you don't take the bird out once a day, it starts to get depressed or aggressive. The bird waits, wait, I'm not sure to say, if you have 24 hours pass, the bird starts screaming at you. You can imagine there are people that they, they have, they take care of their parents, they give them money, they, but they never see them. There was a person who did a test, a social experiment, online recently, in the last year, of what it's like to be in the shoes of a lonely senior citizen. And how did he do it? He went to his apartment and locked the door. He can't leave. He's not healthy enough to leave the front door. Disconnected from the internet because he doesn't know how to use Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and everything. Turned off his uh, cell phone and got himself a regular house phone. Filled his house with books. He have a TV with cable, but no Netflix, Amazon Prime, just regular TV. Whatever food he had in his refrigerator, no ordering Amazon Fresh or whatever you were getting your Instacart or wherever your stuff is coming from. And seven days of living in that apartment, and every telemarketer that calls, oh, maybe it's my grandkids. Every letter that comes, oh, maybe my, someone sent me a birthday card. No, just, just another bill. Nobody to talk to. Nobody knocks on your door. Nobody calls. Nobody visits. Nobody cares. Nobody to make you food. Nobody to speak with in your couch. <clears throat> By day five, the man already started losing his mind. Day seven, it's almost like he started breathing again. Uh, very hard. It's a very hard mitzvah. Don't think it's so easy. And the little that you do, don't think you did enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. But no, I, I only have... Well, now I have four kids. <laughs> so I only have two kids. I now I have four kids. Oh, waking up every two hours and changing and feeding and, the, and it's not even a bit like what is it I'm not, I'm not raising a teenager yet Hashem should help me get through those days I'm not paying anybody's college tuition right now I'm not, it's not, not a, my expenses are maybe big for me but it's diapers it's wife as long as they stay in the house everything's okay how much I do for them so that when they turn 15 you don't even know me this, this attitude you get from them that's what I get for you for 3 o'clock in the morning change your own diaper what happened change your diaper you drooled over your own clothes. You clean your own clothes, right? If we treated our kids so respectfully and what you get back for that, that even when they visit you on Mother's Day, they think they're doing you a favor. Look what a good child I am. I flew all the way from Chicago to visit my mom and have waffles with her and then go back to the airport and Uber and fly home to work. That's keep with that man. It makes you feel better. It doesn't make anybody else feel better. That's he's going to keep adding it to the list because it's very difficult to up. Although Fashiji, there's a third way to interpret this. Yesh mitzvah shiz mana aroch, yesh mitzvah shiz mana katsa. There's some mitzvot, and I think both you were talking about this. There's some mitzvot that take a longer amount of time, and some mitzvot that are a shorter amount of time. For example, keeping Shabbat. You have to keep the whole night, and the whole day. It's a 25 hour ordeal. And if you mess up in any one of minutes of those 25 hours, it's like you broke Shabbat entirely. Yom Kippur It's not like you can I'll just have a little bit of water It doesn't help A little bit of water You busted Yom Kippur You blew it out It's gone and There's some things That are very small mitzvot How long does it take To blow 30 blows From the shofar? Sure. How? The house goes on Okay let's say 10 minutes The most 10 minutes To hear your 5 minutes To hear shofar How could it be? Shake on the lulav It's a biblical commandment You pick up the lulav Once you picked it up You're done It's over Look at Amazon. Now, today again, it's different because they have like 300 pages of Bukat Amazon. But if you do a regular Bukat Amazon, short, it's short. It's not short. The other one is long. This is a regular and it's long. But we call it the short one. How long will it take? A minute? Two minutes? 
it's a biblical commandment. The Kat Kwanim. You don't have to do anything. You just listen to the Kwanim. 30 seconds. They give you a bracha. Now it could be some places you go. The bracha is an hour. That's a different problem. I remember when I was growing up as a kid. Under the talit. Ay, 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 ay. How long can you ay, ay, ay for? There's a reason why they don't do it every day. We could do it every day because we just read it. But they can't do it every day. Because if they would do that every day, they would uh, faint from dehydration. I don't know what happened to them. <laughs> and this is what the Bible says. There's always three categories. Things that are difficult to do. Things that are expensive to do. Things that are long to do. And then the opposite. Things that are short. Things that are cheap. Things that... It's very usual for us to say the one that takes me a longer amount of time is more important. The one that takes me a short amount of time is less important. The one that costs more money for me is more important. The other one is less important. You think mezuzah is less important than your Shabbat? Because Shabbat takes you longer and it's more expensive? How do you know what a mezuzah is? And this is what the Tanah means when he says be careful with light mitzvot like you are with heavy mitzvot. People will buy a house. How much does a house cost nowadays in San Diego? Average cost of a house. Seven hundred thousand dollars. Five hundred thousand. Where are you hanging out, Rafael? We should hang out where you are. At least. Let's say between five and one and a half million dollars. This is what people are buying houses nowadays. So you buy a house for a million dollars, and then you go to the Judaica store, the Sofia. You want to buy mezuzot. He says, "How many doorways do you have in your house?" Sixteen. 16 doorways. Let's make it 15. Easier math for me. 15 doorways. You need 15 mezuzot. Yeah. You say, no, nah, we, only, we only want to buy one for the front door. Why? We don't need to focus on the other ones. It's not a big deal. We only have in the front door mezuzot. <coughs> only on the front door. It's like saying, you know, tefillin, I'm only going to put on one finger. Who needs the whole arm? Just one <laughs> finger. It's not even the correct way to put on tefillin. And then you start to dig a little more. Uh, it's because of the money. So what's the cheapest mezuzah you have? You want to see what the cheapest mezuzah looks like inside? You bought a house for a million dollars. And you're being stingy to put out two grand of mezuzah? Three of mezuzah? A million dollars. That's, that's, that's making $900,000. You spent 900 times more on your house than a, a mezuzah. Like, why not have a mezuzah? It's like buying a brand new car, and then um, you know I don't want to. I don't want to put in regular gas. I want to put in uh, water in there. Let's see how it goes. Come all the oil. Let's see what happens over there. Oh, you stupid! You just bought a Lamborghini. You want to burn your engine with a with a canola oil? Yeah. That's exactly what it sounds like. You make a bar mitzvah for fifty thousand dollars, and you're arguing whether you should buy a tefillin for. $250 on eBay or $312 on Amazon. Don't laugh. I have people like that. Someone bought me tefillin, $400 on eBay. They took it to the sofa. It's not kosher. Rabbi, can you believe you paid $400 and not kosher? <laughs> Which idiot buys tefillin on eBay? <laughs> you probably this is the tefillin are worth like $30. Ooh. You thought, if I go to him, I'll have to pay $600 for tefillin. I'm going to save $200. Bucks. Jewish person. 200 bucks on a $50,000 bar mitzvah you can't spend $1,000 in tefillin if you're doing a bar mitzvah for $5 I understand and the community will help you buy tefillin but people I want to I want to buy cheap tefillin there's someone sitting here who bought tefillin once and in the beginning they could only afford a certain kind of tefillin and then later on in life they went and bought a more expensive pair of tefillin fine they knew where they are now financially and they said that's a commendable thing but to decide yeah he's only 13 who needs to buy him nice tefillin only 13. I'm wearing the same tefillin when I was 13. Some people wear their grandparents' tefillin, and assuming they're still kosher, they took good care of them. And... So this is a mitzvah that's going to last you forever. Why are you being stingy about it? Comes time for the wedding. Rabbi, you just photocopy a ketubah for us? It happens all the time. That's so the truth is, $700 ketubah is also very expensive. But you, you took a band for five grand, a flower person for six grand, you took a, a caterer for 12 grand, and now uh, uh, the, the ketubah, the thing that's going to make you married. You want a photocopy? Why don't I bring you grass in the middle of the table, and then instead of flowers, just put grass. And everybody, they, they, why? It's also a plant. It's what it sounds like, that person. Who needs a band? I'm bringing my, uh, my iPhone, and I'm going to plug it into a speaker. Now, if that's the kind of wedding you're doing, I understand also why you're photocopying. 
But if you're doing a wedding, hotel, coronado, you, you bring a band from Israel. And now the ketubah, the talit, you don't want to buy a talit for your girl. Now if someone asks me to do a wedding, can you just bring a talit from your synagogue? The answer is yes, I can. Of course I could bring a talit from a synagogue. But that's how you want to get married? You want to spend $30,000 on a place to get married and use a borrowed talit from my betmeza with a chamin stain from last week? That's what you want. But there are people that are very... The, these mitzvot are light to them. And this one, Akash Mubuzayim, Vaya Ekev Tishmoon. Ekev. Remember there are mitzvot that people step on them. You have an opportunity not to step on them. This half brings a few stories. One of them is, he said, when he was a rabbi in Tlemcen, in Algeria, uh, they would get ready for the boys' bar mitzvah day. Like, it was a year preparation. Making cookies, dried candies, uh, different different times. The grandmothers would start making a talit bag, a tefillin bag, all kinds of different things like that. Uh, invitations, and who knows what they're doing. Everyone's so focused on it. Comes time for the day of the bar mitzvah, they bring the kids to the synagogue. This beautiful talit bag, tefillin bag. The rabbi who puts on tefillin says, Okay, uh, bring me the tefillin bag. He opens it up, there's no tefillin inside. Masashaya, true story. It happened there more than once. They were so focused on the talit bag and the tefillin bag and everything else that was going to show off to all their friends, they forgot to buy him tefillin. So Yosef says, Okay, so run to the sofer. I will wait, we'll hold up Shachin for 20 minutes. Go run and buy tefillin. They go to the sofer. I just told the last period, yes, I don't have more tefillin. You want? I can write for you. It's going to take a month. So they end up, one of the uncles come. Now, you know, a lot of the family is not observant. They show up, Do you, can we borrow your tefillin? I didn't bring my tefillin. Can I borrow your tefillin? I don't own tefillin. Finally, one uncle comes. He's the one who traveled from another city. He has this old, worn-out pair. Maybe it's not even kosher. And, and this is what the Bar Mitzvah boy wears in his home. He said, did you forget? And all of this, who cares about the cookies? The whole point of the Bar Mitzvah is today he's starting to wear tefillin. And you cared about the tefillin bag, but not what's inside of the tefillin. When it comes to halakha, there are a lot of things that people don't take seriously. And I don't have a list for you of what I, I used to own a book. It was called Mitzvot that people step on. That was what the book was called. Kaddish. Kaddish is a very important fila. How important is Kaddish? Kaddish, when they say the Kaddish prayer, you cannot do anything. What does it mean? You can't even pray. If you're in the middle of praying and they're saying Kaddish, you stop. And you let them say Kaddish. Even if you're in a part of prayer, let's say the Amidah, where you can't answer the Kaddish, you stop and just listen to the Kaddish. How can you pray when the whole community is saying, Yidgadal Yikadash and Allah, may Hashem's name be great. How can you pray? Mishnah Bula says, you're folding your talit, wrapping your tefillin. How can you be folding your talit? Imagine if someone brings their, their shirt, they start ironing it and during Kaddish. Folding your talit is not a mitzvah. If someone's saying Kaddish, listen to the Kaddish. And it's something you see all the time. Like there are some synagogues they add like a hundred Kaddish at the end of the Tzidah and you'll see the people they're setting up for Kiddush they're running around they're talking about politics well, whatever they're talking the news That's what, so why are you saying an extra Kaddish you're setting people up for failure you know that people don't respect Kaddish so don't say Kaddish but when you say Kaddish to respect it to have the proper intention in mind love it at all how many people come time for Sukkot they don't buy their own love it at all they know there's an extra one in the Bittak and I said we'll use that one how much? What our cheapest club in the door is like forty dollars, forty, forty-five, I don't know, something like that. Forty. Stop going to coffee bean for a week, and buy yourself a little oven at all. Why would you skip out on a mitzvah because there's an extra one to borrow? So sometimes comes day seven or eight, that at all is not kosher anymore. People use it, they rub it, they play with it. The kids, uh, people, I see people that come to the dog, they scratch it, and they say, ah, "You idiot! You just made that dog not kosher. It didn't belong to you. I mean, you're the one who didn't pay for it, and you ruined it." Sometimes you'll see, I put the love there and I hide it all here. So when somebody wants to use this one, they have to ask me first. I learned the hard way. It's crazy things people do. It comes time for Hanukkah. I know people, wealthy people. They have houses, they have cars, they own this stuff. But they wait for Chabad to give them a free Hanukkah with the little wax candles. They don't even last 10 minutes, those candles. The Chabad is doing it to help the person who doesn't have a, a Hanukkah or candles. They're there to help spread that light. You own a house. You can't own a... You want to be cheap? Make a plank of wood with holes inside of it. But teach your family that you invested 
more than 35 cents in this mitzvah. I'm not telling you now oil and silver. You don't have to go that far. But you own a house. You own things. You own Judaica things too. People come to Bet Knesset every single Shabbat. And they don't use their own talit. They use talit of the Bet Knesset. And there's a reason why we have talit. There's a reason for it. Obviously it's there for people to use it. But at which point do you say, I'm buying my own talit. How, how, how long are you going to keep coming and doing it a borrowing thing. It's like when you go to the you go to the bowling alley. People go to the bowling alley. When's the last time I was in a bowling alley? Eight years ago, nine years ago. But there are people who go sometimes, you know, once every few months, they take their family, their friends, uh, NCSY, whatever, they go bowling. And you have to pay for those smelly shoes they have there in the front. It's like old, ugly shoes, and then they spray inside of them so you pretend they're clean. And you put them on. And you figure, listen, I'm taking a shower tonight anyways. They must have some standard of cleanliness. They must have some standard. How often do I play, how often do I go bowling that I need my own pair of shoes? But then you walk by one of those alleys where they have like the bowling champions. Some people are champions in learning to learn. Some people are champions in saving people's lives. These guys, their whole life, they're spending bowling. They rent out the lane. They have their own uniforms. And you think, you think they rent the $35 shoes? their own shoes, nice shapes and styles and designs. Because if you're a dedicated player to bowling, you're not going to stick to the bowling shoes they rent you in the front. <coughs> Maybe the first two times you go bowling, the first two times you come to the Knesset, you, but at a certain point, you have your own sidu, your own chumash, your own talit, your own tefillin. It has to be yours. Just because they have doesn't mean you... Be careful about the mitzvot that other people ignore. Sometimes those are the most important mitzvot. There was once a Hasidic Rebbe. I normally don't end up classes with historic Hasidic Rebbe. But Chaumad Yosef quotes this in the Halachot of Purim. So clearly he sees a lot of value in this story. There's one Admo that was sitting by his Purim meal. Everybody's singing and drinking and eating, whatever they're doing. And he runs up to the table. It's like he was attacked by a demon. He runs up there, runs to the bookcase, pulls out a sefer, and starts learning to laugh. And then, what's wrong with you? Are you okay? Shh. He's learning a little bit. Finally, two hours later, he comes back, he sits down, he finishes his meal. Hey, what happened to you? I was sitting here singing songs with you. And I saw in Shammai that the whole Jewish people were celebrating Purim. Everybody was, everybody was eating and drinking. But nobody was studying Torah. And at that moment they said in Shammai, if nobody is studying Torah, we're destroying the world. Why? The Torah is what holds up the whole world. If this room exists, it's because people are studying Torah. So he said, how could it be the world's going to be one minute without Torah? And he went and he ran and he took a book. And since then, Chacham Yosef says that you should always make sure that at your table you say words of Torah so people will be learning something during the meal. Now, not just the one, one second of Torah, but to learn something at the table. Because when everybody else is busy doing another mitzvah, it's the mitzvah they forgot to do that you want to be careful about. Mitzvah that other people step on them. They don't necessarily mean that they're mitzvah people don't know about. So people know about, but they don't take them so seriously. And you have an opportunity to step up to the place and say, these are mitzvot that I take seriously. And when you do that, then all the brachot that Hashem promises and Torah should apply to you, to your children, to your grandchildren, up until the end of time. So we should have a Shabbat Shalom Mubarak. I suggest when you learn halakha, to make notes of mitzvot that you didn't know about before, halakhot you didn't know about before, and to record them so you know what to be careful about.